Jesus in faith and humanity. Assalamu alaikum. Um, we'd just like to say, um, first of all, um, welcome to KCL Absot's second event of the year with um, Dr. Nafiz Ahmed. Dr. Nafiz Ahmed is director, executive director of the Institute for Policy Research and Development and author of The London Bombings, an Independent Inquiry and The War on Truth, 9-11. He has written for The Independent on Sunday and Muslim News and has appeared as an expert commentator on many news channels such as BBC News 24, Channel 4, Sky News and many more. He is also on the Executive Committee for the British Muslims Human Rights Centre and is the Strategy Director for Creative Education and Arts Versa which is specialising in bridging different faiths and ethnic groups together with a specific focus on the vision of British Islam. Please welcome him to the podium with a round of applause. Hi everyone, Assalamualaikum, peace be upon you. Uh, okay, um, I'm going to summarise today, first of all, before I begin, what this whole thing is going to be about and the structure of, of the presentation so that you know where I'm going because it's a, it's a little bit dense. I'm not the kind of guy who does just the kind of pseudo inspirational talks, I'm very more kind of academic, factual, and I think it's very important that we get down to academic stuff and facts and argument. Um, so it's going to be, it's going to be a bit, it might be a bit difficult, but bear with me. <clears throat> the thesis that I'm arguing for is, is essentially that Islam is opposed to violence um, against civilians in the form of terrorism. Um, that Islamic, the, the Islamic understanding of war is essentially defensive and that Islam is, a, is fundamentally about Pluralism, recognizing, acknowledging difference, engaging in dialogue, and the coexistence of multiple communities, and allowing people to basically live um, according to their beliefs and not interfering in that overtly. And to get to this position, I'm going to basically, you know, there's three main areas which I'm going to cover. Firstly, I'm going to rough, going to quickly go over, probably not as quickly as I should, the development of Islamic legal rulings, often known as Sharia, over over the, over several centuries and the historical and sociopolitical context in which this happened. The second thing I'm going to do is look at how this was linked to um, the specific origins of Al-Qaeda ideology and the kind of ideology that, that basically is, is, is used by people in, inside Al-Qaeda and people who are affiliated to Al-Qaeda. And thirdly, I'm going to move away from that and go back to kind of textual, theological, scriptural questions about what is Islam's actual approach by looking at the Quran, um, prophetic traditions, which are histor historical reports about the Prophet's life or hadith, and rereading these texts to see, well, that's, let's see what they actually do say about these issues of war, violence, terrorism, etc. What is Sharia really? <clears throat> Well, what I've done here, I'm just gonna, I've just presented a few Quranic references. There's only like a handful of references to Sharia in the Quran, and actually they're very surprising. They don't describe Sharia in the conventional way that it's described not only in the mass media, but even by Muslims themselves. Actually, Sharia is, is described in very pluralistic, as well as unifying and, and, and um, humanistic terms. As you can see, it's the, the Quran says, for each community among you, we have appointed a code and a way of approach. So shirat, shiratan is a, is a derivative of Sharia. So in, there's already an inherent recognition of multiplicity. It's not just here's, here's one and that's the end of it. It's acknowledging that actually there's multiple. Each community has their own. And if God wanted, he could have made you all one community, but no, he said he, he wanted to test us. And the second part... <laughs> Again, there's a, there's a, this is the only verse at the bottom there which is a, a direct reference to Sharia, using that word. And then we set you upon a clear course of the law, so follow it, do not follow the desires of those who don't, do not know. This is another set of verses, consecutively, which again, emphasize a very pluralistic element. He's prescribed for you the way which he has enjoined upon Noah, and which we've revealed to you, and which you've enjoined upon Abraham, Moses, Jesus, declaring maintain this way and do not be divided. Then it talks about how we should, we are basically, encourages us to, to, to maintain this unity and recognize that there is this unity. 
and believe in whatever book God has set down, <coughs> be just among you, etc., etc. There's no argument between these different communities. God will bring us together in the end. So again, there is this fundamental axiomatic recognition that there is this, plur there is this plurality. But what's interesting is that Islam's place in this, is Quran is obviously discussing what is, an, what is an Islamic perspective, Islam meaning surrender. It's saying that Islam is actually the recognition of this thread through history and this multiple manifestations of this dynamic of we should surrender to God. And the culmination is, Muslims view the culmination of this recognition in, in the form of the Quran. <coughs> The Covenant of Medina was a treaty that was established by the Prophet with different communities in Medina at the time, Muslim, non-Muslim, and the various others. The reason I'm going to talk about this is because it actually establishes a very concrete historical understanding of what was the Prophet's understanding of Sharia, of the way, of the path that we're supposed to be following. What was his understanding of, of, of a framework of governance between these communities? What, what, what were the principles underlying it? And I'm going to quote from a guy called Robert Crane, who is uh, he's an American Muslim scholar. He, runs the, uh, he's, he has a position in the International Institute for Islamic Thought. I'm actually just going to quote him here, because it's a very interesting quote. He says, in the covenant of Medina, the various autonomous tribes were incorporated in a single confederation with mutual rights and responsibilities. The Prophet called this confederation an ummah, or a single community, composed of different ethnic and religious ummahs as subgroups. There was also a common law based on the practice of the Prophet Muhammad and to the traditional laws of each religious group. The Islamic Sharia as a body of law and jurisprudence, like all the other Islamic disciplines, developed over the course of the centuries. At the time of the Medina Covenant, there was no state machinery to enforce the law. There was no police and no regular military and not even an established judicial system. All social life was voluntary. This changed when the Prophet died and especially when peoples in distant places embraced Islam, which led to the growth of power centers that eventually evolved into independent empires based on principles that were un-Islamic from the perspective of the original community of the Medina Covenant." Unquote. It's a long quote there, so I apologize for that. Now the Quran, interestingly, doesn't ever make reference to the idea of a state as understood in modern conventional nation-state times, even when discussing issues like legal recourse and punishment. Instead, it addresses a voluntary community of believers. Now, the Medina Covenant provided a framework for grassroots community governance. The practice of the Prophet indicated that the different tribes, who included Jewish, Christian, and pre-Islamic polytheistic communities, each had their own distinctive ethnic, local customs and norms which were to be respected. The Jewish community, for example, joined the federation as an autonomous group and it was governed by its own rabbinical court. This, these different semi-autonomous communities enjoyed protection of life and property, freedom and equality of religion. They could wear their own traditional clothing, they maintained their own language and customs, and they followed their own religious law. So the social injunctions of the Quran and the Prophet were to be implemented with the generic consent of the vast majority of the members of the overall community across all of these sub-communities. As the late historian of Islam, Professor Neil Coulson, points out, Islamic injunctions could not form part of the tribal law unless and until they were generally accepted as such. The people asked the Prophet for guidance and followed his pronouncements, his pronouncements voluntarily. So, there, so again, there was, no, there was no state machinery as such which enforced these things. I don't want to go into too much detail about the covenant, but I, I'll, one or two uh, articles I'm going, I'm going to quote from there, which are, I think are important. There's actually quite a few, there's quite, like more than, like, like say a few dozen. 